I'm so thankful to Karina and all your team um, for this um, possibility to participate in this conference. Uh, you are as guardian angels for Ilyenkov's readings because um, in Moscow this year we had to postpone our conference. That is why, at least for some of us, it is a sort of compensation. I really thankful. <clears throat> I would like to to show my slides, and I am sorry for possible mistakes <laughs> if you find them, but I hope it will helpful. So, <clears throat> uh, I am going to uh, to speak today um, about uh, the social function of Soviet creative Hegelianism, and. Uh, this uh, item is partly provoked by Katie Chukhrov's remark in Vadim Sidur's museum some years ago in Moscow that Ilyenkov is no more than local informant for the foreign researchers. On the one hand, I'm sorry, I, I'm do you do you hear me? Do you listen to me? Because I am not sure. I cannot see you. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we can hear you. Uh -huh. yeah. Yes. Yes. I, I will consider. Uh, I continue. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, it is true, and as a local informant, he could perhaps give more information about the Soviet culture than anyone else. Mm, but on the other hand, at least for me. It was a challenge, and the problem is to outline his contribution and to show his significance beyond the local frames. But, as Mikhail Bakhtin said, authorship is impossible in the singular. That is why, for this aim, I singled out a group of those Soviet thinkers whose interaction made this contribution possible. The social function of their work will obvious from the content of the task they were solving. So, I will call Soviet creative Marxism, Hegelianism. I cannot change slide. <laughs> oh, yes. It's fine. You have, yeah. Uh, Soviet creative Hegelianism, a philosophy whose representatives understood dialectics as logic and grouped mainly around Evald Ilyenkov, although not exclusively. Genrich Batyshev was hardly an Ilyenkovite. They constitute a subset of the representatives of creative Marxism because not all creative Marxists shared a commitment to Hegelian methodology. For example, Mikhail Petrov didn't share. A substantial demarcation criterion for this group can be formulated in the terminology of Pierre Bourdieu. This group consciously avoided a scholastic fallacy. In terms of Ilyenkov, this meant a rejection of the subjective idealistic version of the logical, that is, the refusal of the sameness of those schemes according to which each separately taken I works. In terms of Alexei Potemkin, everyone who fell into scholastic fallacy belongs to scholastic or deatribic tradition. Do you see this slide completely? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the diatribic, diatribic tradition is characterized by the elevation of philosophy um, to the rank of higher knowledge, which on the one hand crowns the temple of knowledge as a generalization of other sciences achievements, but on the other hand, it cannot study anything due to lack its own subject. The epistemological basis of such an understanding is always a solitary I, whose psychic structure is projected onto the world, creating two strata in it, objective and value. The first is formed by the work of sensuality and intellect, which build subject matters of sciences. The second is the positing of values that glue and hierarchize the world. This is a matter of philosophy. The Kantian canvas of this construction 
is completely transparent. According to Bourdieu, scholastic fallacy can take two forms, depending on whether subjectivity is attributed to a solitary cogito or to a collective one. Bourdieu, borrowing abbreviations from American sociology, calls them red, rational activity theory, and cat, collective activity theory. Red is more or less naive Rabinzanate, when the subject of rational action is a separate individual. This naive version was first formed by René Descartes and, and John Locke. Cat is uh, the transcendental version, when the subject is a society that is understood as an abstraction of the similarity of what is repeated in the activities of each separated individual. I note that upon careful consideration, Popper's criticism of Hegel misses the mark because its real target is precisely cat, where the individual is absorbed by society, but society itself is a solitary super individual, sort of overfed or hypertrophied height. What is the significance of overcoming this fallacy? I'll show on the first historical case when it happened successfully in German classical philosophy. It allows us to single out those conditions of it which are essential and to set a homology between it and the resistance to the scholastic fallacy in the Soviet philosophy. The study of Norbert Elias allows us to connect these conditions with the completion of the formation modern, that is pricing market, in Europe. As Karl Polanyi wrote, this market cannot operate only within one territory. It requires three conditions at once. These are a competitive labor market, an automatically operating gold standard, standard and freedom of international trade. The La Safea market started operating in full force in the 30s of the 19th century. That is why, since the 19th century, alternatives to the market game no longer exist. Every culture entering the industrial capitalist era has been forced to melt her own specific way of producing itself into a market one. The specificity, uh, specificity of the later <coughs> No. It is the commodification of all factors of production, including those that Karl Polanyi calls fictional goods and Karl Marx the moments of production relations. The subject organizer, the direct producer and nature. Now we will go one level deeper for the method methodology. According to Marx, production as the activity making human is an extraction of surplus labor, that is labor sufficient and aimed directly not at satisfying one's individual organic needs, but at satisfying the needs of all other people. This happens necessary because the individual appropriates nature only in those forms that are imposed on him by the patterns of the integration of individuals into their community. The organizer, whoever he is, controls this connection of worker and nature by virtue of ownership of the means of production. And according to Ilyenkov, ideality is the very moment of this general relation of everyone to all. This understanding entails the dependence of the ideality pattern on the pattern of the connection between the subjects of production. Hence, ideality is not homogeneous, homogeneous. But back to the market production. Whether the market will be able to function productively or strangulation of production by the market will happen depends on whether the cultural institutions protect from the literal commodification of the subjects of production, both subjects, allowing them to reproduce themselves. <clears throat> the optimal integrator of all these three areas of reproduction protecting is a national, bureaucratic, not dynastic state. 
it must be democratic to correspond it, its notion or it fu its function. Dynastic does not correspond. The upper classes which privatize it try to protect, of course, try to protect their property from the market, but they uh, regard this property as feudal possession and take the lower classes for dependency as encumbrance instead of giving workers the opportunity to earn a respectable life. The outcome of this type of protection is always the same. National degradation, infantilization of the people, and industrial collapse. A paradigmatic example of such conservative defenses is described by Karl Polanyi, Spinham Lander. And such forms are always typical to states in which political representation exists only for one side of the production relationships. The latter actually privatizes the state and it tends to instill the ideology of monolithic people, race, nation, etc. because this monolithic pseudo-identity is always personified by authorities. This is the cause of fascism, as uh, Karl Polanyi understood it. At the beginning of the 19th century, England and France were the leaders in market development, and Germany was in a transitional situation when the elaboration of the aforementioned defenses was a matter of survival for it, a backward country overtaken by the world market, with the bourgeoisie that was still developing its not guaranteed productive power and thinking culture leading to it. First of all, she had to overcome the seniorial way of thinking, as Zombar called it, and to counteract it systematically cultivating an entrepreneurial, innovative spirit as opposed to waste and demonstrative consumption. Uh, Werner Zombert wrote, what has always afflicted the entrepreneurial spirit, without which the capitalist spirit cannot exist, is crushing into a well-fed ranking or mastering seniorial manners. Therefore, independent productivity, freedom of created subjectivity, and search for the conditions for it should have come to the fore in spiritual life. As Norbert Elias show, shows, um, in the position of the weakest competitor, the winning is an attempt not just to take the place of the strong competitor, it is impossible, but to challenge the very order of the world with a single center of domination in favor of the pluriversal one. This allows you to counteract the unifying strategies that the market leader tries to impose and leads to the emergence in the minds of the resisting culture of the difference between civilization and culture. Civilization is a foreign, formal, pseudomorphic, the form personified by the leader. And culture is a form which grows up on its own, own soil, eigently and having its own clear body and peculiarity. The shifted or open border is beneficial for the leader's expansion. Therefore, he seeks to impose an individualistic, culturally irrelevant way of thinking as universal. But the adoption of these rules of the game by a weak rival deprives the latter of symbolic supports for developing collective resistance and makes the leader's victory legitimate. Thus, abstract liberalism, merging with the local seniorial principle, undermines the protection of local producers, the reproduction of the second subject of the production relationship, and this objectively acting in favor of a strong competitor and leads to the strangling of the local production because in both cases we have the objectification of others, other cultures or personal subjects, and legitimization of the uniqueness of the solitary subject. We can see how scholastic fallacy works here as a tool, or as Siyavis says, mental tool of objectification, and an instrument of imposing for granted those forms of thinking and behavior that protect the dominance of a single subject. And this explains why the one-dimensional point of view of common sense 
on the world and science, connected with the absoluteness of a solitary individual, prevailed in the English and French Enlightenment, it would be difficult even to explain to them the difference between civilization and culture. But in German culture, this point of view was rejected as may be inevitable, but purely secondary, and as evil that needs to be neutralized so that in Germany, true science and metaphysics could sprout from the death and decline of false science and abstract theories. This very resistance led to overcoming scholastic fallacy. The first step was to deploy cogita into transcendental subjectivity, but it differs from cogita only in its abstract universal nature, in which the super-individual characteristics of a person are modeled, nevertheless, in the image of the individual, ich height instead of just ich. On the one hand, this made it possible for the rising bourgeoisie to oppose its own local productivity to its civilizational or market pseudomorphosis, which was destroying it. On the other hand, the bourgeoisie seeks to do this so that the doors below remain shut, those above must open. The best way to occupy this middle position is precisely transcendentalism. It rises above common sense and excludes the transition of an object into a subject and any kind of equality of parties. It is enough to distinguish the dignity of its local culture from the international aristocratic civility, but it is not enough to fraternize with the lower classes. However, <clears throat> this half-heartedness too transparently threatened national sovereignty, and the emperor uh, of, Ge of, uh, German, um, of Germany was frightened by it. Therefore, process did not stop. Although Hegel at one time was the only one who decided to oppose this half-heartedness. His reform of logic is aimed at substantiating such a subjectivity, which is no longer a solitary individual or quasi-individual, but acts as a plurality from which one cannot be distracted. That is, many sociable social individuals connected with other individuals in a substantial way, forming subject substance. This logic allowed us to raise the question of the knowledge and creation of another subjectivity by scientific means, that is, to configure communication as suspension of objectification, as Hegel put it, or objectification of objectification, as Bourdieu put it. It was this orientation of spirit that resulted in the search for institutional, that is located in a real, inter-individual and not in transcendental space, protection by the culture of their productive subjects. In this context, the Gumbel's idea of the new type of the university arose, and the theoretical sanction of these searches by Hegel, which allowed to, to root at all levels of national education in Germany the cultivation of creative subjectivity. The results came at the end of the century, when Germany made a civilizational breakthrough on the, on the basis of knowledge-intensive production. So the habitus of the subjects of this culture was gradually ripening to come to a normal bourgeois state that is democratic with the form of republic and constitution. Since in Germany all moments of this development are clearly visible, this process can be used as a standard for assessing the success of solving homologous problems by other cultures, including Russia. Today, Russia is still a backward country on the threshold of the market and is trying to solve the problem of becoming the subject of a market game. A successful solution, as we have seen, involves the development of a method of conscious educational cultivation of creative subjectivity. Both the emergence of an original philosophy in us and its special interest in Hegel are objectively dictated by this task. 
Um, from this, <clears throat> the social function and character of creative Hegelianism becomes clear. It is homologous to, in function to German classic philosophy, but due, uh, due to the specificity of this function itself, it cannot be just cultic career, Kulturträger. It is autonomous, namely in two senses. The first is the sense of Bourdieu, it is independent of the authorities, of the powers and the market. And uh, the second sense is um, that it um, uh, autonomous in the sense uh, that its contribution, undoubtedly the successor of Western German classics, not only German classics, does not just reproduce or apply it in its own conditions, but is an increment. And in case of an Ilyenkov, I can name several moments. First, Ilyenkov's concept of the subject of philosophy allows us to justify the productive role of philosophy as a science in the study and in the formation of creative thinking. This philosophy is not justified as a philosophy of Cartesian Kantian type and serves not to legitimize, legitimize domination, but on the contrary, to democratize culture. These are the opportunities that Norbert Elias did not see for philosophy, and therefore he announced the end of philosophy and its changing into post-philosophical sociology. Second, since thinking is rooted in history, which goes on, it also determines that logic as a dialectic is ongoing research, and Ilyenkov has demonstrated the significance of dialectical logic studies which are to go beyond Hegel. Ilyenkov pointed out where and how. And third, in particular, Ilyenkov's concept of the ideality emphasizes the social heterogeneity of the ideality, of educational institutions and practices that form the ideality as what makes a human person. Thanks to this, Ilyenkov ruined the ideology of the gift from the site that was not known to the uh, close to his own studies of Nobet Elias and Pierre Bourdieu. He approached to this problem from the side of Tifla Surda pedagogy. And this was the point which our authorities did, did not forgive him and never be able to. As Patonkin, his disclosure of diatribics too. That is all. Thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry if I was too long. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, that, that, that was great. That was great. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it was very clear and helpful. Um, do I have that? Uh, I, uh, some, some, some here, some not. Is it a bad if you have a question, question. Mm -hmm. um, then you put your hand, put your hand up, up and, or um, type, it. type it. Oh, uh, um, Cecile? Your microphone is not uh, works properly. Oh. Mm. Some sounds are... Okay. Uh, like the sound is awful. <laughs> I think it got better as it disappeared. Cecil has a question, I see. Oh, okay. Uh, actually, I didn't. But maybe at the very end, you were talking about a specific kind of pedagogy that Ilyen, like referring to a specific kind of pedagogy from Ilyenkov. Could you kind of explain a little bit about it? Because I never heard about it. Uh, you speak about Tifla Surda pedagogy. It is a, a sort of defectology which works with blind and deaf uh, child, child, children. Is that the work he did with Mesheryakov? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, is this better? Uh... Yes, it's great. It's mm -hmm. fun too. Yes, yes. 
Unmute, Kirill. <laughs> now you're gone. <laughs> and now? Yes. Okay, okay. Any other questions from anyone? Sorry about that. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a question, but I'd rather others asked for me. Okay, I'll ask mine. Well, I, I had a few. Well, so um, you made many interesting comparisons between um, Bourdieu's work and Lyankov's and the broad, um, that broad Hegelian tradition. But there are, yeah, I wondered what, in your opinion, are um, important differences? Because so from um, my point of view, I, I think there's quite a big difference between um, habitus and what Ilyenkov is talking about. So um, jo Joseph Rouse talks about how habitus is in a way always behind us and out of reach. So it's, it's just out of reach. And because of that, in some ways, you can't really um, intervene or like real agency or revolution, I, I, I think is impossible in um, Bourdieu in a way that it's not impossible in Ilyenkov, I think. So for, 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 for me, it's about um, Ilyenkov still being able to talk about agency. What, what, what would you say are in, in important differences between um, Bourdieu and Ilyenkov in that tradition? Thank you, Kirill. Uh, as I have quote, <laughs> um, you consider habitus of Bourdieu as different uh, than Ilyenkov's uh, Ilyenkov's what? <laughs> well, well um, I, I don't think Ilyenkov has a, 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 a separate term which plays the role of habitus. That, that, that that's um, the point I mean is that. Um, Bourdieu has this separate thing called mm -hmm. habitus, but I I is that not just activity in Ilyenkov? It is not just, ac just activity. And uh, of course, Ilyenkov hadn't such a term even. And um, I um, not only put them as parallel studies, I think that um, uh, their uh, studies are complementary to one another. Uh, and uh, this is the value of um, every of them, each of them. Okay, thank you. Um, th there's a Yelena, question from Yelena. Yelena Valentinovna um, Marieva asks uh, a question in, in, in the chat. Uh, she uh, writes in Russian. Shall I read it? Uh, yes. yes. Uh, she uh, she want, wants to know <clears throat> how productive is analysis of Soviet phil philosophy and uh, Ilyenkov's uh, tradition in the paradigm of uh, modern sociology as a whole. Um, she hesitates, she is doubt that uh, it is a proper conceptual frame for analyzing Ilyenkov. <clears throat> Um, my, my first uh, task was to demonstrate that Ilyenkov's philosophy is not worthy to, worthy to be a museum, that it is a working philosophy now, and um, uh, its um, uh, value now it, uh, consists in its complementary character to, to close investigations. Close because they all are derived, are derived from the, the same source. And this source is a Marxist paradigm, is Marxist methodology. Uh, I tried to demonstrate it on one of my slides, uh, the, the very, those moments from, from what all these three conceptions uh, derive. Polanyan, um, three Polanyan, um, Eliasian and Bourdieu. And uh, as a Marxist, Ilyenkov will share, uh, I'm sure, will share the um, requirement that every spiritual formation be uh, considered in its um, uh, emergence from its material 
course, material basis. And I tried to do this now. <laughs> that is why I am sure that is proper, proper paradigm for this study. Thank you. And Yanis? You need to un unmute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, I have a small comment and a question at the same time. I, st I start with a question, okay? I would like, first of all, uh, con I want to congratulate Olga for, the, for this presentation. And um, for me, um, from, as I, from all this that I, I know about uh, Soviet Marxism, uh, it's true that we have a, a movement, a philosophical movement, of, uh, of the, and a, uh, and a renovation of uh, Hegelianism in the decade of 60s, 70s. And we have more philosophers, not only Yankov, but we have also Tipuhin, Mankovsky, Marmadasvili, and others that they are treating also with the logic of capital and uh, other things. Uh, one of the fundamental uh, issues uh, that they elaborate in this renovation of Hegelianism is the distinction between understanding and reason. Verstand and Vernunft in, uh, in German. Mm -hmm. uh, Bourdieu, for example, uh, he describes its uh, own method as uh, genetic constructionism. Constructivism. Mm -hmm. So, he belongs to me 100% to the domain of understanding. I cannot see how Bourdieu can be part of this, what we call dialectical uh, vernunft, dialectical reason. That's that, that I'm saying, I, I don't underestimate Bourdieu. I love Bourdieu. I have been, I have studied many years Bourdieu because I, I, I consider that uh, both understanding and reason are both useful for the for the scientific investigation, but I think I think also you you, you mentioned about that you in the in the first uh, I think in the second page of the of this uh, presentation. I, I think that Bourdieu, that undoubtedly belongs to this movement of, of French philosophical movement of the sixties and seventies, he. He, he belongs to me mostly to this group of philosophy that uh, deals with a difference, like Deleuze, like uh, Lyotard, like others. They are not, are not all the same, but the, he, he's treating with a difference, with a distinction and with all of this um, theory of difference. Uh, and I think that uh, the creative Hegelianism of, uh, in the Soviet Union of the 60s belongs mostly to the concept that we can, could call identity. Because Hege Hegelianism is a philosophy of identity. So I think there is one more fundamental uh, difference between Bourdieu and uh, Ilyankov. I believe Ilyankov uh, affirms to the mostly to the to the identity rather than Bourdieu that uh, he affirms to the difference. That's I just put a question like a comment uh, for more investigation for more more, more thought and conversation. Eh? Thank you, Janet, Yes, uh, thank you very much for your question. But I'm not sure that um, we can put Bourdieu to the uh, area of um, um, not, how it is, <laughs> I rely my opinion on his, um, for example, such text as a uh, practical sense. Uh, in this text, he obviously criticizes um, as a phenomenology approach, phenomenological approach uh, to the cognition, um, as, a, so, as well as a, a structuralist approach. And um, uh, both are, both these um, approaches <coughs> uh, akin for him um, because they share this scholastic fallacy. 
both um, with this uh, with, with this policy, they are both understand <laughs> um, understand uh, in the sphere of understanding. And his own path is different from from both. Uh, is it is a sort of synthetical path? Maybe he obviously didn't uh, spoke it out. Um, he did not um, from this uh, subject matter of special study, but is in his real practice in his sociological studies on quite clearly. Um, quite clearly uses, namely, dialectical approaches. And uh, the dialectic between um, habitants, habitus and institutions, these modalities of the one history, um, consists uh, the content of uh, his, his historical game. It is, uh, in my opinion. That is why uh, he is not a philosopher of uh, understanding. He is reasonable philosopher, <laughs> philosopher, and rather philosopher maybe than uh, sociology, because um, uh, this idea, the, the very idea of sociology post philosoph uh, post philosophical, um, is maybe historical, um, can, can say, historical mistake, historical confusion. Yes. Uh, because they, after Elias, they didn't see the path of philosophy, which would not kind uh, neo-Kantian of neo-Kantian type. It is about Bourdieu. Um, what uh, is um, as Ilyenkov is concerned, Ilyenkov is not a philosopher of identity, as as well as Hegel too. They are philosoph philo both. They were, they both are philosophers of dialectical uh, consideration of um, every identity, identity with difference, identity as concrete identity. And uh, when um, uh, somebody calls Hegel uh, philosopher of identity, it, it may be element of political game, I suppose, uh, to, to um, to, to make him a, a philosopher of transcendentalist type, but he never been transcendentalist <laughs> from the very initial, from the first his published work about the difference between system fifty and Schelling and Schelling. Um, and Karina? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Olga. It was an amazing uh, introduction very very wide ranging um but also very deep <laughs> um i i wanted to look at elena's question again because i think uh, about the how productive is the analysis of soviet philosophy and the link of tradition in relation to modern sociology um um i think um I would say it's much deeper, it gives a much deeper um, and more significant um, depth to what you might call sociology, because in general, um, because what, what you think of takes from Hegel as is both objective and subjective dialectic. It's not one or the other, but both. And that's, that's Ilenkov's um, approach to Hegel. And in the sense that he doesn't see the ideal as a subjective phenomenon alone, he sees it as both subjective and objective, the ideal. Whereas in most of contemporary sociology, although I'm not, I'm not an expert on this, it, the, there's a, a massive tendency to social constructivism, where the, um, the ideal is, re, is kind of reduced to only the social interaction uh, and, and then the dialectic in relation to nature in relation to the object is is omitted and i think um, your diagram olga where you showed the eye everything relating through the eye um is very simple you know is is it is, is an illustration of that reductionism of everything to the to the supreme individual 
consciousness. Um, and, and it actually connects up actually with Lenin's critique of imperial criticism, where the connection with nature through our senses is made into a barrier instead of a, a connection. So that we connect, we cannot, we can never connect with, in this view, you can never connect directly, you can never understand or actually have an objective view of the world because it's always through the prism of an individual and that it begins and ends with the individual. Um, and I, just one last point, I thought your, your explanation of the, the market, the market view, if you like, was, it was kind of, spooky because it was like a description of contemporary neoliberal capitalism <laughs> that you, it was kind of spookily about the domination of the whole global production system by one homogenous system and so the um you know the fact that there's nobody can be separate now from the global capitalist productive system and it, it it has this equalizing tendency. Of course, it has a difference within that as well. But it, it, uh, could you just explain what the SB means? Um, uh, subject. It is subject. Okay. You mean this yeah. slide? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, this picture. Karina, uh, I honestly, I didn't catch everyone that you <laughs> said, uh, unfortunately. But as I caught, uh, caught yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that Bourdieu does not belong to the tradition of social const con constructivism at all mm. uh, because he very beautiful criticizes the uh, such uh, manner of constructivism of a uh, type of Schultz for example yes and um, Microsoft sociology Chicago sociology with its micro inter individual connections of course um, I speak about objective process, inter-subjective, in, not in the sense of you and me, we together, no. <clears throat> My speech is about uh, the process um, uh, of uh, the community as a whole, without which uh, no one can, can touch the nature. Uh, Marx wrote that uh, um, no one, no, no human, can uh, pro appropriate uh, somewhat from nature uh, earlier than he himself will be will be appropriated by his community. This holiday of the community is not a willingly uh, set um, thing. It is a process uh, which uh, above of the conscious of every individual. It is objective um, process in, in your sense, if you mean this, this aspect of my considerations of society and its function. But um, human society is uh, everywhere when we have this structure, subject organizer and subject direct producer, because without this structure, uh, human cannot uh, extract surplus labor. Human starts when he starts product uh, to product surplus labor that is labor not only myself but only whole my community not only for my neighbor or my um, child for whole community it is a general objective necessary forms in this generally uh, objective necessary forms every individual touches to the nature and nature cannot be given him uh, in other forms at all. This is about objectivity. Mm. Um, was this, uh, the second part of question was something about Ilyenkov. But I, I didn't, re I don't remember <laughs> it. Maybe you remind. It's just that I, I can't made a link of diff make, makes a link of different from a lot of I'm not I wasn't talking about Bourdieu in general the approach in sociology is that the, the the ideal is a purely social and subjective thing 
but it's not it has no objective dialectic it's not hetero heterogeneous it's actually um, homogeneous because it's it's uh, inseparable from the individual consciousness it's identical with it and, and Ilenko is opposed to that concept ideality and Ilenko too ideality is inseparable from individual consciousness uh, because of the real subjects of this process are individuals in Ilenko mm, uh, but um, uh, in, um, human individual uh, cannot be human uh, alone it is a system quality uh, you cannot be human alone solitary as um, in phenomenology we see yes phenomenology starts with the solitary mental life um, human individual in accordance with Elienkov cannot be human cannot be even individual but fragmented David uh, as, uh, as some some French philosopher um, I, I, I don't remember who he only uh, firstly starts to be a human when he includes in this um, he, he he can he can be separate himself he, he can autonomize himself gradually um, due to his participating in whole communication system and system of less scale uh, will not think and uh, uh, what about historical and logical this uh, um, enter of philosopher into social sociological uh, field uh, say um, is uh, is close to Ilyenkov's intention uh, it, it is uh, you may see it quite clear on the works of Mareev his co-operator co his close maybe maybe the closest co-operator uh, his main uh, monography is about the dialectic of historical and logical and uh, uh, historical studies must be included in the theoretical tissue when the method uh, points out in, in accordance with Marie. Not with Marie, but in Marx too, with Marx too. And it was Ilyenkov's position too. That is why the um, researchers of Bourdieu and um, Elias are not just close, but uh, akin. Akin, and uh, we we have uh, in Bourdieu many times uh, places uh, when he complains on the disciplinary bodies which are not organic to the studying subject matter. In order to build a good theory of state, you must be not only political philosopher but only histor economist, historian, and and so on. Thanks. Um, I'll go to Yanis and then I, I also have a further quick question. I would like to ask Olga about uh, this uh, historical and logical. Uh, it's, it's true and it's clear that Bourdieu starts, he elaborates his theory um, from, uh, and he starts from many assumptions of Marx and from historical uh, materialism, etc. So all this dialectical, we can say dialectical relation between habitus, culture, structure, economy, the four types of capital, cultural capital, economic capital, symbolic capital, um, etc. All, all, all this we can uh, definitely add it in Marxism and uh, they are very, very scientific to me. Uh, the, the methodological problem that I, I, I cannot clearly understand is that Marx, for example, in his uh, uh, approach of historical, in, in the conception of historical materialism, he, he classifies, he classifies the history from with uh, in in a frame of uh, the of, of social systems. Mm -hmm. So he elaborates a kind of uh, classification of the history through uh, historical systems. I don't see that Bourdieu elaborates kind of method, and uh, I think this characteristic of Marx's uh, historical uh, materialistic conception of history, it's 100% Hegelian, and the, and the Hegelian method is exactly this kind, to be able to classify the, the development of the subject matter of investigation. Well, that's a question, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
as I quote, um, uh, the question is uh, that Marx created a classification, but uh, Bourdieu did not do it, yes? Did not create classification. Mm -hmm. Uh, the thing is so, through the history of that through the history, the through the history. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Marx himself in, in spite of uh, he creates this uh, this sketch of classification in his uh, German ideology uh, <clears throat> uh, Marx himself uh, many times said that um, uh, historical that materialistic understanding of history is not a philosophy of history, it is a key to restart uh, researching of history from the start. Uh, to research uh, history from the start, every time from the start, something like that, yes? I cannot say it in English because <laughs> I, I learned Russian version. Uh, that is why this, his model of uh, mode of production, when we find subject direct producer and subject organizer, is of course is um, a pattern of uh, uh, formation, whole, uh, some holity, yes, uh, which corresponds to some culture, uh, holity of some culture. Um, it, it is equal for for Marx um, uh, this uh, mode of production and definite culture, but um, uh, his uh, five uh, five um, stairs are relevant to European development. They are relevant to Europe. Um, his key uh, allows him to, to build this classification on historical subject matter. But Boudieu had another tasks, maybe, uh, such as El Elias too. Elias um, prefers to speak about figurations, yes? long and slow processes without um, clear borders as in Marx. Um, of course they have many differences and uh, these differences are worthy to, uh, to be studied further. Um, and, uh, and your question is um, quite uh, he, uh, has a, a great weight of course. But I think that um, to compare uh, these uh, close uh, approaches is a quite useful task. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Um, that, that was, yeah, um, really a kind of fa fa fascinating area as well. Um, I, I wanted to, to go back to um, a point that um, Yanis made earlier. Um, in um, Bourdieu and the sort of French tradition that he was a part of, um, there is a French tradition uh, that reads uh, Spinoza um, instead of um, Hegel. Um, so um, Etienne Balibar um, popularized the concept of the trans individual and makes quite a similar criticism um, to the one that you make that um, you made in your um, presentation. So um, trans individual. Um, from uh, Gilbert Simondon, originally um, is yeah the um, their reading of um, Spinoza, and it's that exact criticism about how um, modern production um, individuates us in this um, potentially um, alienating way, um, and I yeah so um, you have those, those thinkers. Um, Simon John Deleuze Balibar, where I again um, personally associate uh, Bourdieu with them. Um, I, I guess the question is, um, is Spinoza um, not enough um, for Bourdieu? What does um, Hegel add? Or, or um, if you're familiar with uh, the trans individual literature, if you have any opinion about the idea of the trans individual? Thank you, Kirill. Um, you uh, called some uh, names, but from them, among them, I uh, am acquainted, uh, acquainted with uh, Simondon. Very few, unfortunately. But uh, I, as I can judge, I cannot agree with, with Simondon's uh, approach to the form and material. 
I think that the, his fail is the, in this, is rooted in this um, thing. And I may refer to the, to, to the very deep um, study of this problem as logical, on, on the logical level, by Sergei Mayev. Uh, because it, it was his um, the main um, one of the main his uh, uh, themes dialectics of form and um, content and uh, as to Simandon I think that um, because of it, um, this uh, this fallacy uh, his um, he sees uh, um, individuality of human uh, um, in such a way that he underestimating uh, individuality. I I don't agree. I'm not agree that in every individualization is a necessary uh, alienation. Um, because of his mistake, he he cannot differ one from another. Other critics of Spinoza, I, I unfortunately <laughs> I don't know. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. Um, anyone else? Um, we do have um, still some time for a few more questions. Um, you can either type it or put your hand up and un unmute yourself. Or yeah, it, it, you can type the question or type that you want to speak. Oh, Olga, can you stop sharing that screen because mm -hmm. we're no no longer on that one, are we? Thank you. Great. Olga, could I ask? Sorry, Carol, could I ask? Yeah. Obviously, you're right that you can't have the formation of ideals without a society and without human beings, and that they are socially uh, require a human society to, 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 without his society, without being part of other people, we are not human and we can't think. In a, certainly not in, with advanced concepts, um, but I would still argue that Ilyenko's position was that the ideal is not reducible to individual consciousness. Not reducible. Yeah, not reducible. Not reducible. Yeah, that's that's the point I was making, and therefore it is both objective and subjective, as indeed it is with Hegel too. Um. It, it entails from Hegel, of course, the dialectic subjectivity and objectivity in the sphere of notion. It is the third part of his logic, yes. Uh, in Hegel, in Hegelian thought, as I understand it, um, object is a tool, mental tool, uh, to create a subjectivity, another subjectivity in Hegel. You cannot create another subjectivity and therefore subjectivity at all without objective tool because only so without tool. what tools without what tools Ob objective oh, general okay. and necessary in Kantian language uh, only a small interruption you refer to the logic of notion to the chapter of objectivity mechanism chemism and uh, and uh, teleology you refer to this chapter when you say tools, you may consider them as a steps to to okay. steps of this creation. Yes, of this. But you refer specifically to the chapter of objectivity to the science of logic. One when you say tools, time. in which chapter to refer when you say that Hegel uh, considers that he used tools to create subjectivity to the philosophy to the science of logic or the philosophy of, of spirit. Um, I think that uh, the tools um, uh, to which Hegel re refers to are um, in his um, sphere of notion. Uh, these tools, um, uh, he, he calls object a sort of form, formalism. And uh, the same way as formalism is uh, solves into uh, content, uh, the similar way this object and his development is uh, solves uh, is, uh, is solved in another subjectivity and uh, all these um, texts uh, such as philosophy of history and others 
I think uh, cannot be understandable without this logical content, without this general decision of this problem. Um, Hegel uh, every time uh, keeps keeps his attention on the another subjectivity um, when he construct constructs uh, his uh, um, his historical patterns, his steps of history. Um, I think it seems to me <laughs> so. Um, but I not I cannot exclude that Hegel. Uh, did not eat without any mistake. Yanis, did you see, did you cont are you content with this? Okay, yeah, yeah, I understand, and I understand, I understand. Because I, I ask you, because uh, I agree with you that Hegel uh, has. Uh, can I speak for? <laughs> Uh, sorry, guys, I didn't ask. <laughs> sorry. Uh, could I also ask someone else? Because I already speak a lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, I, I, I say that uh, I agree that uh, the tools uh, had uh, an important uh, position in Hegel's uh, theory. But those tools uh, had a different position if we are talking for uh, the chapter of objectivity within the discipline of notion, of the concept, or, we, or if we're talking about philosophy of spirit. Yes, we have uh, similarities, but it's different because in the chapter of, of objectivity, the chapter of objectivity is at the same time the passage and the transition to the idea. So it's not exactly, I don't know how to say, I don't know, I don't, I don't know if you say exactly that, but to, my, to me, it's not exactly tools. It's mental tools. Mental if we're tools. talking for science of logic, yeah. It is mental tools, and the main thing is that these tools Hegel uh, brings to the contradiction. Uh, he uh, he uh, gets uh, them from the contradiction and brings them to the contradiction. The contradiction is the the condition of the success um, on the output, success to attain another subjectivity. It is the logic of put a plurality, pluriversal, pluriversal uh, relationships with others, not to merge them and, uh, and uh, subordinate, but give them a freedom to create another subjectivity as an artist. <laughs> and every historical step, every historical uh, formation for, Geg as well, for, for Hegel as well as for Marx is uh, nevertheless, is anyway, the mode of creating, historically creating such creative subjectivities. And every formation is living uh, till, um, till it can, um, can ensure, can, can provide this reproduction of uh, its subjectivities. When it, it close, which it seems which uh, culture loses the, um, the ability to reproduce uh, their plurality of subjects, this culture die, dies. Um, so we have about five minutes. So if anyone who hasn't spoken does have a question, uh, that would be great. Um, otherwise, I have um, a small one. Um, well, maybe it's um, too hard to answer in the time that we have. But um, for me, uh, with uh, Hegel, well, if I think of the um, master-slave uh, dialectic at the end of that section and the phenomenology of spirit isn't... So, so yeah, I'm not sure how you can have individualization without alienation. So if, if, if I, um, certainly in, in that part of the phenomenology, is isn't that kind of um, confrontation with death that I um, um, see myself um, as an object and, yeah, and, uh, and unless it's a, it, it's, a, it's a different sense of the word um, alienation, I, I'm not sure where in Hegel you have 
individualization without alienation. Um, maybe it is. Um, uh, it is. Um, so it sounds a bit odd because uh, because every individu individuation is uh, um, separating myself from others. Yes. Uh, but the body uh, itself, um, uh, it uh, it uh, not ought, uh, ought to be uh, every time uh, the body as uh, separating only. The body is um, ambiguous. It uh, as well separate as uh, coin, um, as um, co co not coincide, conjunct, conjunct, <laughs> conjunct too. Uh, that is why uh, I, I share Bakhtinian approach to the creativity and to the mode of life, life which is worthy, um, worthy for human being. Um, it, it, human being must be creative uh, being. It, um, uh, it uh, does not have to be uh, a happy being, but he must be creative. And to be creative, you must be individual. You must be co be conjunct with other individuals. Individuality is a, a condition of um, uh, every the very ability to um, out to go out uh, from yourself, uh, go abroad yourself. But this uh, abroad uh, suppose uh, this Buddha. Um, through which you must make a step. Thank you. And uh, a last chance, if anyone else does have a question, uh, we have time for one more. Okay. Uh, in that case, thank you very much, Olga, and um, to everyone else. Okay. And I'll pass back thank to Karina. Thank you very much. Thank, thanks, Carol, for, for facilitating. Um, I just want to thank everybody again, especially I think it's delightful to have Elena with us and Alex and Sasha and Sigurd who came in at the last minute. <laughs> um, hello. It's, you know, it's been amazing to see you all and hear you.